Fishermen travel deep into the Sundarbans region of India. Their work is done for now. They'll wait till morning to fish again. It seems quiet and calm. But these fishermen are in incredible danger. From the forest, they're being stalked by the deadliest tiger in the world a tiger that can strike from land or water and kill in an instant. Another victim taken in the night. The tigers live here in the Sundarbans, gnarled fingers of thick mangrove swamp that stretch out into the Bay of Bengal. In this dense, tangled forest, every year, people are killed and eaten by tigers. These tiny islands at the mouth of the Ganges River are separated by twisting ribbons of water. The isolated clumps of mud and forest make up the Sundarbans Tiger Reserve. The thick trees hide one of the largest concentrations of wild tigers. But there's something else that sets these animals apart, and the tigers that live here hunt, kill, and eat humans. I was led to a site where tigers killed two humans, and you could see the approach, the tracks of the tiger approaching the human footprints, and there was still dried blood on the ground. Um, it makes you kind of look around and, and really reflect that um, when you're in a place like this, uh, humans aren't dominant. The people of this region live on the edges of the Tiger Reserve in small villages. The menace that lurks in the forest surrounds them. It is a hard life here. Most make their living by fishing or collecting honey. The best fishing and the richest stores of honey are found deep in tiger territory. Normally, this area is closed to visitors, but authorities do give villagers permission to enter to make a living. It's here that the tiger attacks occur. No one knows how many people have been killed by tigers. Many deaths aren't reported. and the bodies of the dead are rarely ever found. The tigers go deep into the woods to devour their prey, but the stories live on. Jamuna Sardar. Four years ago, her husband went fishing for crabs. It was the last time she saw him alive. 
Sunil Mondal tried to wrench his son from the mouth of a tiger. He failed. And now his son's wife, his son's family, his son's daughter are all left behind. Surat Sadar. His father was killed while fishing, pulled from his boat by a tiger. The threat of violent death hasn't stopped daily life from continuing throughout the Sundarbans. Every day, Kamala Mondal can be found at her small village store. Mondal's husband was killed by a tiger while he was fishing for crabs. Without him, this store is her only way of making a living. Sudeshna Day is a doctor who works in many of these villages. Here, every family has somebody or the other who has been lost in the hands of the tiger. And mostly what the tiger does is he attacks from the right side and from behind. So we mostly have neck injuries, hand injuries, and right-sided scalp injuries. It is very rare to survive a tiger attack. Ashit Mondal is one of the few who have. Just a few months ago, Mondal was deep in the Sundarbans, fishing for crabs, when suddenly he came face to face with a tiger. We are very poor here. We fish for our livelihood. One day, I was standing on the boat, pulling in a net. When a tiger came running from the jungle, he saw that I was on the boat and came charging towards me. He jumped into the water, then swiped at me with his paw. The force of it pulled me off the boat. The tiger pulled me down into the water and tried to bite the back of my neck. But it was hard for him to find the right grip. He clawed at the top of my head scraping off the soft skin and tissue. I hit the tiger as hard as I could, and he ran off. In a few savage moments, Mondal's life would be changed forever. A tiger's enormous forepaws can shatter bones. Its teeth can pierce a skull in a single bite. My ear was almost torn off. This was all cut and the skin was just hanging from my face. It was ripped all the way up to here and over to my ear. My neck was bleeding badly too. The tiger also did a lot of damage to my arm and the back. This whole part of my head was gone. It's not healed yet. It's still an open wound. Mondal's survival makes his story unusual. But the fact that he was attacked in the first place makes him just another in the long line of victims. And I've often seen tigers in the wild, followed them on the road, um, and really haven't had a fear. But I'd have to say that if I met a tiger in the Sundarbans, I think I'd be worried. What has made the tigers of the Sundarbans so bold? What has turned them into man-eaters? Tigers are a deeply entrenched part of the culture in the Sundarbans, a fearsome thread woven into the tapestry of everyday life.
People who live here believe a constellation of supernatural forces guides and shapes their lives. Before entering the forest where the tigers live, the priests and elders of the Sundarbans pray with the villagers, asking for protection. It is said, without the God's blessing, a tiger attack is virtually assured. Bandavgar National Park is one of those places where wild tigers roam. Found in the heart of India, it is one of a handful of tiger reserves in the country. It has a rich history. In Indian legend, this fort, which dominates the park, was a gift from the great Lord Rama himself. Bandavgarh has become a favorite tourist destination. It's one of the best places in the world to see tigers in the wild. These are Royal Bengal tigers, the same type of tiger that lives in the Sundarbans. And like the Sundarbans, this is certainly not a zoo. The tigers here track and hunt their own food. Even with all the people nearby, there's no serious concern of tiger attack. Since the park was established in 1968, no one here has been killed by a tiger. During the same time in the Sundarbans, over a thousand people have been hunted down. The classical image of the man-eating tiger is that man-eaters were an exception and they were old and they were injured, sick, and they couldn't um, kill game or, or livestock. So they had to kill people. People are easier prey than our game and than our, than our livestock very often. It seems to me there are two types of man-eaters. Uh, there are man-eaters that get injured and are desperate for prey. But deep in the Sunderbonds, they're killing even when they're very healthy. Living in the shadow of the man-eating tigers is part of daily life in the Sunderbonds. Each spring here, honey collectors prepare to take their chances to earn a living. The danger of entering the forest makes this a solemn occasion. Their families and other villagers gather to offer sacrifices to ensure their safe return. But even with the permission of the park rangers and the blessing of the local priests, men from these villages enter the forest never to return.
As they travel out into the forest, they put themselves at the mercy of one of the most ferocious hunters in the world. The murky waters, muddy banks, and thick swamps of the Sundarbans make it almost impossible to see the tigers here. Very few researchers have braved the hostile environment. Very little is really known about the Sundarbans tigers. The Sundarbans at first seemed to me a, a pretty exotic place. Nowhere else in the world do tigers live in a mangrove habitat. And it's hard to walk. Uh, the nematophores make it, I think, difficult even for tigers to go through some habitat. There's deep mud. But there's one thing that tigers need. There's abundant prey. And that's why there are a lot of tigers there. A census is conducted in the Sundarbans to try to answer one of the most basic questions about the tigers of the region. How many are there? The census takers are forest guards who search the muddy banks of this area for tiger tracks. The nature of this region forces the tigers to swim from island to island looking for prey. While all tigers are comfortable in the water, the tigers in the Sundarbans have become especially adept here. This rare footage captures one of these tigers in the act. Seeing a tiger in deep water can be the last thing a fisherman here ever sees. The tiger is tracked to where it left the river, but seconds after leaving the water, it has dissolved into the forest. The dense wall of green can easily hide a killer. It is extremely dangerous to get off the boat. A census taker offers a small prayer for safety. Field director Pradeep Veer says they take other precautions as well. Apart from the firearms, the two or three devices which has been devised for Sundarban conditions, one is the tiger guard. This is protective uh, steel body structure and uh, this also used the bulletproof sheet which uh, has uh, spikes on the back because uh, any tiger which attacks prey or human being, it attacks mainly from back and on the neck. So this takes care of the, this uh, particular problem. Beside this, we also use the face mask because uh, most of the time it has been seen that the tiger attacks when you are most unaware of its presence. So a number of times you can try to attempt the tiger fool that you are watching the tiger from the back. Sometimes the census takers don't have to travel far to find fresh tiger prints. These marks have been discovered just a few meters from a ranger station which is protected by a high fence. A tiger has been here within the hour. While some work quickly to gather the print, the others keep watch on the forest. In the year 1995, one of our staff, Prabhash, was actually killed by a tiger. And this was a very serious accident. Uh, and the whole census operation was stopped because of this. Each tiger's paw print is unique, as individual as human fingerprints. By comparing this imprint to other castes, they can learn if this is a new animal or not. In this way, a rough census of the tiger population is gathered. This paw print and others like it are giving insights into this unique animal. 
Well, the biggest thing we've noticed so far is that the tracks of tigers are really small. So we think male tigers could be even 150 pounds smaller than the big tigers elsewhere. The prey itself may be a part of the reason for the smaller tigers here. The largest animals tigers eat in the Sundarbans are about a quarter of the size of tiger prey available in the rest of India. But without more research, it's difficult to know if the difference in the size of prey has pushed these tigers to hunt down humans. The honey collectors are now deep within the forest, in tiger territory. With the blessing of the tiger god, the collectors search for beehives. The tigers can be anywhere. But the reward is worth the risk. This is what the honey collectors have searched for. Hives, dripping with bees and honey. The honey collectors light their bundles of grass to smoke out the bees. Their prayers and their masks are their only protection. There is a story that tigers never attack people from the front, but always from behind. And therefore they have carried out an experiment in the Sundarbans and they've given the people masks to put on the back of their heads when they walking, were walking through, through tiger areas. And in the beginning, the tigers seemed to, have to fall for, the, for this, this ruse, but then they cottoned on and they discovered that this was a ploy. And they again attacked people even though they were wearing a mask. There is one part of the Sundarbans that has been closed off to people. It's known as the core zone. Around this is a ring of land where people with permits are allowed to fish or collect honey. But the core zone is strictly off limits to everyone but government personnel. Field director Pradeep Vyas and his wardens patrol the area to keep people out. Tiger attacks uh, are certainly more in core zone because uh, tigers are not used to the presence of human beings. Uh, they come in contact with people very less as compared to the tigers in the fringe zone. Recently, a group of locals snuck into the core zone. They had no permits, no permission. A single tiger attacked and killed three men. Vyas and the others were shocked by the attack. Normally a tiger will only kill one person, then devour their body. Vyas believes the attack shows how little we know about these ferocious animals. In my opinion, tiger understand human behavior very well, though we have yet to understand the behavior of tiger. With so little known about the tigers here, it's difficult to determine why the attacks occur. Perhaps the very nature of this place can explain why the tigers in the Sundarbans are the last in the world to hunt humans. The Sundarbans is one of the most dangerous places in the world. Tigers regularly hunt and eat humans. In this remote part of East India, park rangers take unusual measures, hoping to keep tigers away from the villages, 
hoping to keep predator and human prey apart. Whether this noisy attempt at animal control works is unknown. This extreme effort to keep tigers away from the villages of the Sundarbans is not duplicated in other tiger reserves in India. Here at Bandavgarh National Park, villagers ring the tiger reserve, just as they do in the Sundarbans. But no one can remember the last time someone was killed by a tiger. The tigers here don't always keep to the boundaries of the park. They regularly enter this village in search of prey, but strangely, have never attacked people. Raising cattle is the primary livelihood here, but the herders have no concern for their personal safety when it comes to tigers. This tiger, B2, is the best known cattle killer in Bandavgarh. He leaves the park frequently in search of easy prey, but even though he often travels near the villages and comes very close to people, he has never attacked anyone. Every day, herders near Bandavgarh take their cattle out to graze. They don't enter the park, but keep to the land just outside Bandavgarh's boundaries. B2 and other tigers, of course, don't know where those boundaries are. When B2 sees cattle, what he sees is easy prey, no matter where it is. But when people are about, B2 is loath to attack. People make him wary. People keep him at bay. B2's most legendary hunt took him far outside the park. There he killed a large cow and dragged it back towards his territory. In a display of amazing strength, he threw the animal over a fence before feeding on it for two days. But B2 has never hunted people. His size, strength and quickness is superior to any human. But he has never attacked. Claude Haddoncourt went to India to see tigers firsthand. What he saw almost cost him his life. The tiger attacked the car while we were stopped. We were listening to the barks of the deer that announced the presence of the tiger. Everyone was listening carefully, and when we turned around, we saw the tiger on the road, about 200 meters from us. He got closer and we could take a few pictures. We could see the tiger was beaten up on an accident because he had a big wound on his lip and was missing some teeth. He was walking normally, but when he saw all the cars, he started to run faster and faster. And finally, when we least expected it, he jumped in our car. I was bitten on the arm and on the hand. And uh, why the hand? When the tiger leaped on me, I fell back. And I instinctively protected myself with my arm on my head. It was a terrifying attack but a once-in-a-lifetime event. In the Sundarbans, though, 
the tigers hunt and kill humans regularly. We are in the jungle fishing and we are looking for firewood to cook with. In the forest, I saw a tiger lying down. Then it suddenly jumped on my brother. The tiger ran off with my brother in his mouth. I followed him with my axe. And as I ran, I thought, what will I say to my mother or my brother's wife if I go back home without him? I decided to kill the tiger and bring back my brother. I kept running and was able to hit the tiger with my axe. The tiger dropped my brother and ran away. I picked up my brother and tried to bandage his head. I screamed for help, but nobody came. I carried my brother toward the shore and as I walked, he died. Why do these attacks continue? It's difficult to know what separates the tigers of the Sundarbans from those everywhere else in the world. There are several theories, but little hard proof. Some believe the water itself is to blame. Because the Sundarbans rest on the Bay of Bengal, the salt content of the water is quite high. Typically, tigers live inland and drink from fresh water lakes or streams. Here, tigers drink the salt water. And some believe that a constant diet of salt water has injured the tigers, putting them in constant discomfort. This pain, it's thought, has made them more aggressive. Fresh water ponds were dug to provide an alternative for the tigers, but the attacks persisted. While an intriguing notion, there has never been proof that the high salt content is behind the attacks on people. Another theory is also tightly bound to the waters here. Understanding the tides is crucial to fishing in the Sundarbans. In several hours, these nets will be covered with water and perhaps fish. The regular movement of the tides shapes the behavior of the fishermen. And some who study the tigers of the Sundarbans believe that tides may also make these animals unusually aggressive. Another thing that's really difficult in the Sundarbans and it's a problem for tigers in that most of the area floods uh, tidally twice a day and then in the neap tides the really high tides almost all of the Sundarbans is flooded and we really wonder where tigers uh, den they may have a problem finding a dry spot to den There is another theory that the tigers of the Sundarbans are more aggressive than others because conflicts that would be avoided through scent markings have to be played out. When the area floods, scent markings that define tiger territory are washed away. Aggression then becomes the only way to defend the territory. When the water recedes, the mud is left behind. Some believe this mud makes it more difficult for the tigers to hunt, so they resort to easier prey, man. Another theory suggests that tigers don't knowingly hunt humans. 
Making a living in the Sundarbans is back-breaking work. Collecting firewood or rigging nets means constant stooping and bending. Some experts believe that in this vulnerable position, tigers can mistake a person for a small deer. Once a tiger has mistakenly killed a human in this fashion, it is believed that the animal develops a taste for people and is more likely to kill again. There is an even more gruesome theory. Some believe that the tigers have acquired a taste for human flesh because of the weather. Brutal cyclones frequently batter this region, killing thousands. The rivers and canals are often filled with the bodies of the dead, on which the tigers feast. All through history, I have seen special circumstances under which all of a sudden there occur what you could call tiger epidemics or tiger plagues. And that is that all of a sudden there is an increase in the number of people being attacked by tigers. And I would say in nine out of 10 cases, that is because there has been a sudden increase in the number of dead bodies of people, dead people. Either because of, a, of an epidemic, cholera, smallpox, or because there has been a cyclone, a tornado, a flood, and that's because all of a sudden there is, there is a surplus of human bodies. And tigers thrive. They, they have more food than they, can, almost, uh, than they can use. The list of theories grows, but is inconclusive. The tigers in the Sundarbans are certainly unique, and perhaps the explanation for their behavior can be found by looking not at tigers, but people. Through the late 1800s and early 1900s, tigers were hunted down ruthlessly throughout much of India. But what is less well known is that tigers were taking their own. Nowadays, tiger attacks are rare. Um, but if you go back even a century, or even less, 70 years. Um, tiger attacks were, were quite normal. I've seen several records, both in India and Indonesia, of, of the tiger threat becoming so um, severe, so, so large, that people just abandoned their villages, that just, just went away. Tiger attacks so fierce that they emptied entire villages are hard to comprehend today. There are estimates that as many as 300,000 people were killed by tigers from 1800 to 1900. The answer was obvious. Fewer tigers would mean fewer tiger attacks. Open season was declared on tigers. Closely studying this history, challenges the belief that only sick or injured tigers have been man-eaters. If you read about tiger attacks in the early 19th century, in the 18th or 17th century, they were so frequent that it is impossible to explain uh, such a frequency um, by assuming that only sick and, and, and injured tigers attack people. So I argue that before, let's say, 1850, if they had a chance, they, they would kill a, a, a person. A perfectly healthy tigers. Here in Bandavgar, healthy tigers don't hunt humans anymore. Boomgart believes that tigers can learn from history. Man-eating tigers in almost every part of India were hunted down and killed. The tigers that live in Bandavgar learned that fearing humans meant survival. But the massive tiger slaughter that occurred in this part of India did not happen in the Sundarbans. I think tigers across India have faced hunting pressures for a long time. And so they're much more wary of humans than the tigers in the Sundarbans. I don't think the tigers in the Sundarbans are afraid of people. The people don't seem to be carrying firearms. And the tigers know that. 
The remote and hostile nature of the Sundarbans protected tigers from hunting in the past, and it continues to protect them today. Even when they know that a tiger's a man-eater, if it lives in the middle of the Sundarbans, there's not much they can do about it. They can't really hunt it, and they don't. The dense maze of mangrove swamps allows these tigers to continue to hunt humans, as tigers all across India once did. From mother to cub, tigers here have passed on a taste for humans from generation to generation. The biggest difference is that tigers may teach their young to be man-eaters, and so that's why there's so many man-eaters in the Sundarbans. Not fearing humans, the tigers here keep hunting them, and the killing continues. A young child is lost in the forest, at the mercy of the deadly tigers of the Sundarbans. This play tells the story of daily life in this hostile land, of the very real danger that lurks in the wild, beyond the villages. The people here believe that the tiger god, Daxin Ray, can kill if he is displeased. They believe he can read minds to gauge the amount of respect for him, that their survival depends on his happiness, or the intervention of another deity, Banbibi, the goddess of the forest. It is a constant balance between life and death. A balance the people here accept. They realize that while the tigers make the forest dangerous, that very danger protects the forest and their livelihood. Most of the people in this zone are poor and for their survival they have to go for fishing and other things. But uh, they also admit that tigers' presence in this forest is essential for their own survival because, because of these tigers, these uh, mangrove forests are surviving. The villages here are filled with orphans and widows, and people who have harrowing tales of survival. It is the reality of life in the Sundarbans. People here understand the risk. They understand that in the Sundarbans, humans are not the most dominant animal. That if a tiger decides to kill, it can and will. This is a place which has remained virtually untouched by time. A place where tigers don't live in fear of people. Here, tigers still reign supreme. Oh.